but I guess I would say just start with these solid things versus jumping into specialized tools that seem cool. I'm going to list five, and you let me know if you think there's a good sixth or seventh here. But the big five would be for different types of locks or different types of techniques um, for you to be using in the field early on to start developing your skills. The first base that I would cover with my tool purchases would absolutely be actual lock picking. So picking and raking. Number two, slipping a latch on a door from the pull side. Number three would be a push door latch slip. Uh, the fourth is going to be going to be easy decoders. So a decoding tool. And I'm so sorry. My brain is just exhausted from teaching this last weekend. I forgot what number five was. Oh, I, I do remember now. You said it earlier. A, um, a wafer jiggler tool. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. We are live. Short intro, shooting for 60 seconds here because I don't want you guys to skip it. Oh, you could skip it. I don't care. Today's episode is which lock picking tools should you buy first? This is to answer the question, hey, I was thinking about getting into lock picking. Should I buy this tool or that tool or both tools or what do you think? So we're going to give you all those answers. And of course, they're very subjective. Today, it's me and Dave here. And the housekeeping is if you want to send me some feedback, a good place for that is my email account, which is pat at utac.io. Uh, you may have messaged me at my old email address that I had listed on my old podcast episodes. I check that less than once a month, uh, but occasionally I grab some stragglers from there. Next, if you want a discount on a Fortress K9 protection dog, they are amazing, just like Arrow here behind me, uh, who's doing her job watching me record. Uh, just email me at my email address and we'll hop on a phone call. We'll find out if our types of dogs and services are right for you. And if they are, we'll get you a discount over at Fortress K9 for one of their dogs. All right, Dave, hello. I think we're in the topic officially. Oh, gosh, thanks All right. for the Patreon. The Patreon are such a big deal. I'm so, so sorry. I usually say that first. Patreons, thanks a million. You literally keep the lights on for the show. Sorry. Hello, Dave. <laughs> hello. That really is the most important part, though. Uh, like, not joking. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's get into our first disclaimer here. Take us away. Nomenclature and tool names and technique names and lock names uh, and definitions in the lock picking world, it's a mess. So, be patient, have some grace. Uh, with yourself and with others. So don't get discouraged if you had called something the wrong thing or pronounced it wrong. Uh, and be careful viewing others that have used maybe the wrong terminology or nomenclature um, and be willing to learn new things. So there's lots of products that have six or seven names. There's lots of products that have one very generic name uh, that people kind of will come up with uh, slang names for. Uh, and then there's, there's you know your professional grade word and your generic word. And then your slang word. And then there's multiple professional terms for the same exact thing, even within you know one manufacturer or multiple manufacturers. So nomenclature, breathe, and have some patience when it comes to lockpicking terms. Cool. Okay, so which tools should we buy first? The classic answer of it depends. Mm -hmm. We're going to start off with someone with zero experience in any of this. And where to even get starting or started? Picking and raking are going to be the bread and butter of the skill set. You can probably get going for less than fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we both I think carry in our EDC the Bogota rake picks. Mm -hmm. B O G O T A. They're pretty small, about twenty five bucks. Sparrows Mace set too that has a rake and a small little hook pick and it bogota pie is a little more expensive it's the same pick profile as the bogota it's just a set of three versus a set of two and they have more of a solid handle whereas the regular bogotas are a little bit more of a streamlined long thin handle the bogota pies have a wide flat handle they're called pie because of 3.1 and 3.14 inches long and last but not least, the one that 
is always a solid winner. The Civvy, C-I-V-V-Y intro kit. This has full size picks, several different pick profiles that other things don't have. And all of these will get you going, and they're all pretty accessible, and they're all things that you can start learning on. That's the quick rundown of how to get started raking, which maybe we should define raking if you, you want to take that away. Sure. So, yeah, I'll, if, you, if you're going to buy your first and only one lockpicking set, anything from that list that Dave just gave us is fantastic. Um, and it's kind of, I think it's really, I think this is so nerdy and so fa- fascinating that these are the tools that real world professional life or death operators will carry that are trusted and tried and that excel in the field. And they're all less than 50 bucks. Well, each of them individually is less than 50 bucks. Some of them less than 20 and they're very high quality and very professional grade and very good. So, uh, kind of, kind of an additional disclaimer here is, or a warning here would be, be very cautious when you're buying your first lock picking set or second or third. And you see advertisements for, this 300 piece set for $500. What a steal. No, that's bad. Be very, very wary of anything that sounds similar to that. Uh, okay. So all those things that Dave listed are for raking and picking. This is a technique where if you have a keyway with a little zigzag zig on it, probably like most of the common, uh, front door locks in this country. Um, if you look at your front door lock from the outside, from the locked side, you'll see zigzag zig. It's either left, right, left, or right, left, right. It's very simple, um, and your key will be flat on one side, and it will have a couple peaks and valleys on top. That's for pin tumbler locks. They're arguably the most common locks in this country. Um, And those sets that we listed above will get you through a huge percentage of those locks that you will see on your daily routine. So you walk out of your house, you can probably use one of those tool sets to get through your front door lock to, to unpick that. You go to your job. Maybe if it's not like if you work at a bank or a jewelry store, they have higher security locks. You probably can't pick those high grade commercial locks with some of these sets, but maybe you can. Um, but within those businesses, you'll have uh, manager offices, you'll have locker rooms, you'll have janitor closets, you'll have all sorts of locks on the inside of your building um, and some on the outside that those tools will get you through. By way of taking these tools and putting one tension wrench in the keyway and one rake tool or pick tool in the keyway, and just managing two variables, which is applying some twisting tension to the plug or the core or where the key goes, applying some twisting tension and lifting those pins either in a random or in a kind of scientific order. Uh, I think I went kind of deep on that one, but any of those kits we listed above will get you started with access through the keyway by manipulating the pins and applying tension. That's what you should buy first. If you have nothing any of those that we listed above by those uh let's do this too this is going to be episode 220 so i believe that the plug for that is going to be uncensored tactical.com backslash 220 uh i think that that let me double check utc i'm going to type it out backslash 219 yep it's should uncensored tactical.com backslash 220 will we will give you all the direct links for all these tools Cool. And yeah, with raking, this these are all sets that we listed um, above that'll get you started with raking and picking. But for regardless of what role you're doing or what settings you're in, these are incredibly high value and widely applicable. One other thing I'll add is especially if you're in more administrative settings would be a set of wafer jigglers, uh, sometimes called tryout keys. Southern Specialty sells a set called Covert Jigglers. I like those a lot. A wafer lock is a kind of lower security lock, but you'll find it a lot on desk drawers, on lock boxes, on cabinets. Not so much on doors that are used as entryways, but they're incredibly common, though typically more on the administrative end of things. But, I mean, a lot of the car, like cheap car gun lock boxes, for instance, have like wafer locks on them. Even your home fire safes might have a wafer lock on it. So it's a very common lock type that you can also buy these cheap tools. I want to say it's like $12 for a set of the covert jigglers. 
that's another incredibly high use item regardless of your application and southern specialties doesn't make the only ones i know sparrows has some i think theirs is called the rock out set those are fine too for a lot of these you don't need to get hung up on the exact minutia of the exact profiles of the tools to a painstaking degree i think it's more important to stick to quality products that have established themselves more so than fretting about the difference between the the um, covert jigglers versus the rock out keys profiles. Uh, yes, I agree. Oh, sorry, I was typing. Uh, I agree that it's important to find a tool that does the thing more than those very specific type make model of tool. Um, there are there's a lot of leeway with these tools, so. Uh, if Dave has a stainless steel, like your standard original Bogota set, and if I have the Bogota Pi set, him and I can probably get into 99% of the same locks with each of those different tools. Uh, sometimes that percentage is a little different. So sometimes if I'm using like my Sparrow's Mace Pick set and he's using a standard Bogota set, uh, there might be six or seven out of 10 locks that overlap. So he might be able to get nine or 10 locks with his kit. I might be able to get like seven or eight locks with my kit um so there's there's it, it's always a percentage game that we're playing when we're dealing with lock picking especially our curriculum which is tactical lock picking um, none of these techniques are magic none of these tools are magic there's always a chance they won't work and even when you're very confident um almost i can't think of a single technique where i would go yep 100 percent chance we're in uh, because even if you're if you have a three digit lock and you try every single combination from 000 all the way up to 999. Technically, that's a 100% effective technique. You will find the code that is set for the lock. But there are locks out there that are broken or like really sticky or rusted on the inside. Um, so even if you have the right code and you pull really hard, the lock might not open. So um, none of these tools are magic. None of these tools have a 100% effectiveness rating, um, and your skill level will change with the same tools. So if you can open 5 out of 10 padlocks that are on your desk, and you practice for a year, you can probably then open 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 of those padlocks. So it's always a percentage game. So if you're getting started, any of the 5 kits that we mentioned above, your just original Bogota tools, or really any tool that says Bogota on the title, uh, your Sparrow's Mace Picks from sparrowslockpicks.com, your Bogota PI or Bogota Pi set, your folding pocket set. Um, it's usually a black, pink, or gray body, plastic body with a pick, pick profiles that will fold out of it. Uh, then you have your Civi intro kit, which is longer handles, uh, but very good profile selections and very good tension wrench selections. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, any of those five kits I think are the gold standard for people that pick locks a lot. Yeah, and... There definitely are times where slight differences might come into play. But if mm -hmm. you're coming into this as a newer person, I would almost compare it to someone who wants to buy a handgun and get into combat shooting. Whether or not you have a Glock or an M&P or a SIG, sure, some small details between those, like ergonomics, grip, whatever, might matter for some people. But at the end of the day, you can be an effective combat shooter with any of those. Same thing with these kits we listed. And also to go back to the firearms analogy if you want to get into combat shooting don't buy a high point so while there might be some differences between the recognized established platforms the difference for shooting is going to be much more your training and your application once you're within that ballpark now if you're going outside of that quality ballpark sure you're going to have some issues that's how i think of these tool sets though yeah yes you can find yeah, so yeah, you can find some differences. Some things might work better for you than others. But anyone who practices can be incredibly effective with any of these. That's a great point. Um, yeah, so what, we, what we're not trying to say is buy any tool. What we're trying to say is buy any quality tool. Um, and that's this community is really great. So I like, I'm very happy that we've sp spent a lot of effort trying to upkeep this good community. Uh, there is a lot of information sharing. A lot of it is for free. Um, there's a lot of support. There's a lot of answers that are given freely. Um, so if you ask almost anybody that's established in the lockpicking community, whether it's Locksport 
or locksmithing um, or people on Instagram that teach kind of the covert entry stuff that we do. Um, just ask, hey, is this a good set? You might get some, sometimes you might get the long, in depth, nerded out answer, uh, or sometimes it's just really simply, do not buy that. Um, so, good segue. Let's move into the do not buy list. Uh, almost anything on Amazon for your basic lock picking is probably garbage. Uh, now, again, if you hand out a high point to a super duper Navy SEAL Delta Ranger guy, they could probably kill some people effectively with it, but it's not a good tool. So there's no reason they would choose to carry that. Same thing with lockpicking. Almost anything on Amazon is garbage. You could probably make some things happen with it, but if you want to use this skill, especially if you want to use this skill for emergencies, um, almost anything on Amazon is trash. Again, uh, we mentioned it once earlier. Anything with um, starter kit or beginner's package for $100 or $200, um, it's not that all of those are bad. It's a, there's a lot of marketing that is bad for a lot of tools like that. So for instance, the Civi intro kit, it says intro and kit together in the title, but it's a really high quality set. Um, there are other things that you'll see as soon as you start searching lock picking on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, uh, you'll start seeing ads for lock pick tools and they will blast you with, you know, 600 piece intro kit. So, be very wary of that. Um, a lot of those are very misleading. They're very overpriced, um, and they're not very effective. Uh, again, if you're just getting started, I wouldn't spend more than $50 on my first tool or my first set, period. Anything else from you for the don't buy list, Dave? Cool. Uh, no, I would say, too, just... Don't go towards super specialized tools like I know Bogota makes much smaller versions. That's cool. That might have its specific place for specific uses. But I guess my other piece of advice would be, again, back to handguns. For your first thing that you're starting on, build your skills on something that's a good all-around use, solid quality, proven track record. If you want to branch off and start using more specialized stuff for special applications, that's awesome. But I think it's much more productive to build your foundation first than buy some tiny lockpick set because you can think of an application or maybe its size is advantageous to conceal or whatever. That you know, that's cool and all that fits your parameters. But if you're really starting from zero, I think it's so much better in the long term just to build the foundation. So not that people can't, but I guess I would say just start with these solid things versus jumping into specialized tools that seem cool. I agree, and that's part of our outline below, too. We're going to cover that again. Um, so now I want to move into what we're going to call the big five. So there are probably... I'm going to list five, and you let me know if you think there's a good sixth or seventh here. Um, but the big five would be for different types of locks or different types of techniques um, for you to be using in the field early on to start developing your skills. So... Um, the first base that I would cover with my tool purchases would absolutely be actual lock picking. So picking and raking. Uh, so just a keyway attack would be one of the first things I want to learn. And you do that with a tension wrench and either a pick or a rake. So the big five. Number one, keyway attack. Number two, um, I'm going to type my list while I talk here. Um, pull, door, latch, slip, which would be a latch gym. Okay, so slipping a latch on a door from the pull side, meaning if you walk up to a door and you twist the handle and you pull that door to open it, that usually means that there's a gap between the door and the frame where you can visually see a deadbolt in a latch and you can use a straight metal tool to reach in and manipulate those latches. So I would get a tool for that. And those tools are often, they have multiple names, uh, but one of them is a latch gym, J-I-M, like the, like the name, uh, or like Slim Jim that used to be used for cars. Well, there's a latch gym or a door gym tool. It's usually a metal tool with some type of hook on it. It will slide into the door gap between the door and the frame, and it hooks that latch and pulls it to open it. So that's number two for the big five. Number three would be a push door latch slip. 
which is done with a tool called a flexible S-H-I-M, a shim tool. Um, you can make your own. We've done lots of content on this. You can make your own by cutting out the side wall of a milk jug, a plastic milk jug. Um, you can cut up, uh, or you can use a like a flexible thin cutting board, like the ones that are like really, really bendy and flexible that you can get like at the dollar store. Uh, you can use one of those. You can use a laminated sheet of paper to do a latch shim technique. And this is when you're on the push side of a door, meaning you twist the handle and push the door to walk through. And that's because the spine uh, that runs around the perimeter, the inside perimeter of a door frame, if you're dealing with a push door, that spine will cover the visual and physical access to that latch. So on some doors, you can look at it, you can see the latch, and that's usually a pull door. If you're on the other side of the door, you can't see that gap between the door and the frame. So you have to use a tool that kind of snakes its way through the door on the frame which is a flexible tool, really thin, flexible tool. One, two, three. Uh, the fourth is going to be, let's see, Jim, Shim. Uh, fourth is going to be easy decoders. So a decoding tool for not all, but almost all locks that have multiple wheels on it. So not, not the dial locker locks, like when you go to high school and you have the round body with the shackle coming out of the top and you spin the thing three times to the right, spin it twice to the left, spin it once to the right. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the combination locks that have one wheel that goes from zero to nine and another wheel that goes from zero to nine and another wheel and another wheel. So those locks that have those three or four wheels, um, you can use a really thin, really thin flexible metal tool to reach into a gap next to all those wheels. And you can kind of, you can, uh, Use a tool to kind of feel and decode different spots on that wheel to line up parts of that lock and to gain access. So you can use what's called an EZ decoder, the letter E, the letter Z, uh, which is a play on the word easy, like the opposite of hard. So an EZ decoder is a great tool for that. Uh, the tools are very th uh, thin and flexible, which means they're also very delicate, so they will break. Uh, there's a category of tools uh, that Dave and I talk about in our curriculum, which uh, we refer to as disposable tools. That doesn't mean they're low quality. Um, they, they could be very high quality, um, but it means a couple things. It means that we always buy them in bulk because they're disposable, so we always have multiples on hand if we need them. Uh, it means they break easily, um, or it means that they're so effective uh, that we want multiples of them, and if we damage or lose them or give them to somebody, we don't have to feel bad about it because we treat them disposably. So, so your big four so far, a keyway attack with a tension wrench and a rake or a tension wrench and a hook. You have a two latch attacks. You have a, an attack from the push side and an attack from the pull side. That's number two and number three for the big five. Then you have decoding tools, which is number four. So you can put a tool into a combination lock to decode it. And I'm so sorry. My brain is just exhausted from teaching this last weekend i forgot what number five was oh i i do remember now you said it earlier a um a wafer jiggler tool so wafer rake slash uh what's referred to as an auto like automobile a u t o jiggler not to be confused with a juggalo so a, a jiggler tool which is used for wafer locks uh, some older vehicles, uh, even some modern vehicles, but most older vehicles, you can open with an auto jiggler tool. Um, lots of filing cabinets use these types of locks that you can just jiggle open. Uh, mailboxes, toolboxes, cabinets. Um. Okay, so we got the big five here. We, again, will list some of our favorite tools of that type. And I'm going to take a deep breath and drink some of my ice water here and let Dave do some fill in for me. Cool. Yeah. Just to reiterate, this is the baseline that you can apply to any role, any application, almost any area of operation that you're in. These are just what we'd recommend to start your skill tree, and then you can build your skill tree out from this in multiple directions. And yeah, uh, yeah, I think we pretty much covered that one. On to the uh, next segment of my last oh, yeah. note for that what? would be if you don't know how to do these these big five skills, then you're severely limiting your entry skill set. These are very easy to learn with a quick crash course. The tools are not expensive. doesn't take a lot of time to train. Uh, doesn't take an immense amount of knowledge uh, to apply these attacks at a, to apply these attacks at a beginner level. So we really focus on these big five in our course, but we also expand. 
That's it. Cool. One more for me. While we're on the subject of buying your first lock picking sets and first tools, uh, we should probably hammer on your tension tool is probably going to be more important than splitting hairs about your rake or pick profile. Yes. 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 Most of these come with a variety of tension tools, but just keep that in mind that we had already said, don't go out and buy the hundred piece pick sets because you don't want a hundred picks. You want, and I mean, you don't need to, you don't need a hundred tensioners, especially not to start off, but I'd rather have three pick profiles and 15 tensioners. Honestly, that's probably, yeah, that's probably most of what I use even for single pin picking is, Maybe, maybe I use a total be- between raking and single pin picking a total of f- five picks, if that. But way more tensioners. So, again, if you're just starting out, these will come with tensioners. Go, uh, just go ahead and experiment with them. Get used to them. These should all come with adequate tensioners, to my knowledge. Uh, the Bogota Pie actually, I don't think, really comes with a great tensioner. That might be the only one. On the ones here that doesn't come with a good tensioner uh do the pocket pick sets i forget off the top of my head come with many tensioners i think they have what's called a bull nose tension wrench it's got that little kind of lip over at the top corner of it um but yeah the folding pick set has a pretty good tension wrench on it but it's only one Mm -hmm. uh the bogota pies and the original bogotas both of them don't have great tension wrenches but dude being able to pick through probably 50 percent of every residential front door in this country um with that $25 tool, still pretty amazing. So yeah, it's not the best tension wrench profile, but it's still very good. Yeah, so that might be a slight expansion, I guess. That So yes, as we said, these sets will definitely get you going, get you incredible capability, as is. But yeah, uh, that just one other word on getting into lockpicking is as you look to expand, focus more on your tensioners than collecting every pick profile you can imagine. I agree. Which brings us to next segment. Cool. You should have... grow out of... Oh, yeah? You have more? We got the lag. Go ahead. No. I, I was going to go on to our uh, next section Perfect. unless you yeah. got something else. Nope. Go ahead. You want to grow out of your tools before worrying about acquiring too many. Everything we just mentioned above will give you incredible capability in use and the stuff we mentioned above you'll probably use through your entire lock picking journey. The ones we listed above won't ever become obsolete. I agree. There is so much to be gained out of those, so you don't necessarily have to grow out of them in the sense that you you know, you stop using them before you buy new tools. But there is so much to learn and do with just the ones we listed above. Be, so get to the point where you feel like you're kind of plateauing with those before you worry too much about needing to get a new specific type of tool or profile. And there might be times where that is legit that you need a different type of profile or tool for a specific scenario. So we're not saying, I guess, that you won't run into scenarios where you might need a specific tool. But just in general, just hit the limit of training with your tools I agree. Um, So that once you hit that limit of training with your current tools, and and that's a really good point. I I titled that wrong, which is to grow to grow out of your tools. It's actually to grow out of your skill level, which is buy the tool and use it on as many locks as you can, and practice and troubleshoot troubleshoot and try to stretch that tool to its limits, and find out you know find out when you need to buy a different tool, as opposed to going I'm going to buy all of the professional tools I can. And then I'll maybe try to use them. Um, so getting the most out of your tool before worrying about buying more. Uh, that's what, what we call establishing your baseline of your skill set. Uh, the Kind of the gun industry equivalent would be, it would be silly for me as a brand new shooter to go with a friend to a shooting competition and to see some dude with a, like a, with a $9,000 race Glock with like a flared magazine well and like, like a golden flared top port ejection, like super laser flashlight, like pretty dazzled up Glock. I can go, oh, cool. 
And if he happens to be a pretty quick and efficient shooter, I might go, oh, I should buy that $8,000 gun. That will make me a good shooter. False. Just like lockpicking. So it's not, oh, this tool's way more expensive and there's a lot, a lot more picks in it. This will make me a good lockpicker. False. Uh, the very first set that we mentioned, just the original, what's called a Bogota set. Uh, it's 25 bucks. We have it on our website. Lots of other places you can find that too. It's a very good set. Um, and it's it's like it's the workhorse of the lock picking world. Just like your regular old mid size nine millimeter Glock can perform wonders and will for the rest of your life. Um, so that's your baseline. Uh, growing to the limit of your tools. Okay. Okay. I think that's most of what I have for that segment. Um, don't stretch your budget to buy stuff that you don't know how to use yet. Use what you got and learn the limits of those tools first. And that might take some time. Cool. So let's talk about you have the baseline set, which again, incredible capability in just that. How do people start making decisions of the next tools to buy when they're new? This is where it's going to get a little more specific to you, what you're doing, where you're operating. This is where we can't just give blanket recommendations as easily as above, which would apply to everyone for the most part. Are you somewhere where you're doing this as a first responder? Are you doing this as part of a job where you're going to be making lots of entries? Are you pursuing this more to add the capability to your life? How often do you run into emergency situations where you have to gain rapid entry? Versus how much of this will be an administrative skill set for you where there's no one's life or property on the line. There might be a time constraint, but at the end of the day, it's not it's not really an emergency. It's just an, an inconvenience will kind of be more or less the definition of administrative. There's not a real consequence on the line, I guess, to approximate it. I thought maybe we could break down a couple of those different paths people could take to start buying a set of tools specific to what they do once they have the baseline squared away. Why don't you start us off with the emergency framing? Cause that's really how you tack out its start and a lot of the content and really what a lot of the framings around. Sure. Uh, some of the students from last weekend, I, I taught a course last weekend in Houston, Texas. Um, and some of the students questions were, um, we kind of went down the covert entry rabbit hole. So, Almost all the techniques that we teach in our tactical lockpicking course can be applied in a covert entry operation. But our what, what Dave and I, what we call our framing, is that we've designed our curriculum for certain people to be used in certain ways. And that doesn't mean certain people aren't allowed to use it. That just means our, our avatar, if you will, was a person that wants a skill set added into their life. So it's not their primary role. It's just an extra skill. And... That skill was going to be used for emergency access with some non-destructive lockpicking type techniques. Um, so if it's purely administrative, meaning, hey, if we have a lock that we need picked open, we'll call you and you can come pick the lock. Completely administrative. If your role is going to be, uh, it's going to be, oh no, there's an emergency there and we're locked out. And for some reason or another, Bolt cutters aren't the best option. Kicking the door is not the best option. Battering ram is not the best option. Or you don't have those options available. So we put together a small kit uh, recommendation that people can easily carry with them. It doesn't get in the way of how they live their life. It's not super expensive. Um, and the curriculum is designed to help you answer questions about how to use the right non-destructive or lockpicking type technique. Uh, how to use the right technique at the right time during an emergency. So that's kind of the framing overview. You can use lockpicking in any way you like. You can use it for fun, for a hobby, for, you know, to compete against other people. You can use it as a first responder. You can use it as a super spy, whatever. Uh, so our framing for our curriculum, the way that we teach lockpicking techniques, was for non-destructive entry during emergencies. Uh, so different people that will be using this skill set in different ways will all have a strong baseline and then they can alter that baseline to fit their life and their role a little bit better. How are we doing so far? Yeah, so what tools would you suggest people start looking to expand their baseline, specifically for 
emergency access framing. So not counting stuff that you'd recommend for administrative purposes. Sure. Uh, big emergency oftentimes is vehicles. And even if that emergency is just time, like, oh, no, this is going to take forever. Like, this is kind of a big deal. We need to get in quicker, even if it's just or we'll be late or if it's or I'll lose my job or if it's a, a real emergency is, oh, no, my kid's locked in the car. It's 100 degrees out. Well, if you can see through the window and the kid's not dead, then you have a little bit of time. Uh, but if he's in there and he's passed out, you smash the window. So emergency access would be a vehicle entry kit. Here's the thing. If you store your vehicle entry kit in your vehicle, then you're going to have a hard time using it to get into your own vehicle. But you can use it for everybody else's vehicle if you have that with you and you have access to your car or truck, whatever. So some of the best options for that are what's called a vehicle reach tool. Like you're going to reach very far into the vehicle. That's usually just a flexible, uh, long, uh, semi-flexible, semi-rigid, long piece of thick gauge wire. And you're going to use uh, the equivalent of a blood pressure cuff. Uh, They're called air shims or uh, just a a, a rugged airbag that will slide between the door and the frame of the vehicle that you pump air into it. And it separates the door from the frame of the vehicle a little bit. That allows you to get that reach tool in through the door and the frame and then to manipulate buttons inside the car. So some tools that I would expand early on in my progression of my lock picking skill set would be a reach tool and an airbag. And that will get you into probably 90% or more of vehicles uh, with very little training. Uh, It's just, it's logistical problem solving. Like how do I get this airbag in? And then it's, how do I reach the right button? Uh, But it's not really, how do I use the tools? They're pretty easy. You can learn how to do it in a quick crash course. Cool. And I think we can further split this down between, is this emergency access as a first responder or as a citizen. So morally, I don't think there's a difference. I think the difference just comes into what type of situations you tend to find yourself in. Some other high yield tools, and this is going to have a little overlap with the last show uh, about favorite tools, Mm -hmm. but some of those were favorites for a reason. If you are a first responder or you're in commercial facilities a lot, something like an under the door tool for $30 gets you really far, really quick access. I don't know if I would suggest someone who otherwise isn't in a bunch of commercial settings goes out and buys an under-the-door tool as the first thing they expand to. It is going to be useful. It is going to have its applications. It's a great tool, regardless of your role to have on hand. But if we're talking first thing, I feel like that's an important distinction of being aware of what type of situations you're frequently in. Same thing with the crash bar tool. Like the big, long bars that could chunk in when you push the door to open it in commercial settings there's a what, tool for that too sorry dave what kind of noise do they make when you push them kerchunk okay thank, thank you <laughs> you're welcome uh so those might be tools that would be higher on your priority list if you're a first responder or just free or frequently in commercial settings residential settings or maybe b- besides the front door of an office building might not have as many of those Sure, the the under-the-door tool might be a little more common in in an office building just throughout the building. But again, that's stuff you have to weigh specific to you. So that might be the first divergence where I might say, if you're not frequently in commercial settings, they are helpful tools to have. I'm not saying they're not helpful or useful tools. But that's kind of a difference, I think, where I would prioritize those types of tools depending on what you do. Are there any other splits in the path that come to mind for you where maybe certain tools to be higher priority for one group of people over another. Yes. And I talked about this in my last class. We talk about it quite a bit and it's probably, I think it's probably listed in my, in our, the first book for UTAC tactical lock picking. Um, it's a tool called a C rat tool. And that's, uh, an acronym for the Seattle rapid access tool. It's by ignition. Uh, USA is the company that makes that it's big. It's bulky. It's very solid, it's very reliable, and it's uh, very effective. It's also very expensive. Um, And there are other tools that will do the job of that for less money and less weight and less size. Um, But it is a, it's a rapid, it's a wildly popular tool in the fire service. Um, 
but their role is different. So I wouldn't, if I was outfitting, if I was teaching a fire service and some firehouse called and said, hey, Pat, come teach our guys and get us equipped a little better. I would not say, buy all these tension wrenches and all these hooks and all these rakes. I would say, hey, you guys have a halogen bar that will, what our, our friend Cody says, these halogen bars will get you into every single obstacle out there. This C-Rat tool can sometimes do it faster and easier. And so throw, have one or two guys on your team throw this tool in their bunker pants and one of your empty pockets, and that will be really helpful. So as you're walking around the perimeter of the building, while you could shove your halogen bar into a tool and rip it off the hinges, you could also take the C-Rat out, unfold it, stick it in and swipe the latch, and the door or the gate or the, you know, the hinge or whatever. It's open. Non-destructive. That's also really good because firefighters sometimes need um, control of a door after they open it. Meaning, if they kick the door off the hinges and the door falls down, now they have, um, I'm not a firefighter, but they have uh, a problem with oxygen going into and out of the building. So sometimes it's good for them to be able to close that door securely after they've gained entry. So it's a tool that's big, heavy, bulky, expensive, but would fit them really well as an additional tool in their bunker gear. Who do you think bypass drivers? Oh, sorry. Flag got us again. For me, I, I'm questioning taking that tool out of my gear bag. Um, it's the heaviest, bulkiest tool in my gear bag. Um, and because I have a small gear bag, because it's a, it's an additional skill set in my life. It's not my primary job to make entry. Um, that space is very valuable inside my bag. So I might be getting rid of that one soon. Um, your next question about bypass drivers, go ahead. Yeah. Who would you recommend bypass drivers to as a higher priority purchase? Sure. Short answer would, I hope would be if you don't have the big five skills covered that we talked about earlier, then I wouldn't worry about buying a bypass driver. Uh, along that's, that goes with almost all your expansions. If you, if you don't know how to do those five things and you don't have tools for those five things, don't go expanding elsewhere. There's, there's so much quality and value and return on investment in knowing those big five skills that you're, you're, I mean, you could do whatever you want. Absolutely. But, uh, buying a bypass driver is not as good of a return on investment for you. Um, yeah, because they're lock specific and also it brings up the next question to ask yourself on a weekly basis, how many different types of locks do you come in contact with? So again, you could be, you could even, so obviously we have the first responder angle, but let's even say you're a handyman or you work in construction or you're a contractor. Maybe you're in all kinds of facilities, commercial, residential, you see all kinds of locks. So that might be one framing to consider how you look at this. Mm -hmm. You might be someone who goes to the same place of work every day back home for the most part you're probably only going to see the same few locks each day so bypass drivers can be lock specific so if you are and again back to the first question we started with how often are you in emergency situations are you often in them are you often getting call outs to an emergency situation or are you working this into your skill set as hey i'm not regularly in them but I would like to be prepared for an emergency situation should it happen. All questions to ask yourself. So bypass drivers, when we say bypass, we mean you're not worried about manipulating the pins to get the lock to turn and essentially function as designed. Bypass denotes you are circumventing the actual like function of the lock to just hit some magic thing in the back of the lock that just skips having to mess with the pins. It skips having to make everything line up super mathematically. Uh, so, so they're way faster when they work, but it requires a little more analysis of what lock model you're looking at. Is your bypass driver work for that? Um, so just things to consider, too, for things like bypass drivers. I agree. Um, and I have something to add to that as well, which would be... Uh, re- for all of these things that we mentioned, we do talk about people that are and aren't first responders. Um, and that's not a, it's not a value judgment. Like, Oh, you shouldn't have these tools. That's not it at all. Just to be clear. Um, and I said earlier that 
the way that we teach and the foundations and the curriculum that we teach are designed to be a small, limited skill set that you add into your life. Small, limited isn't even really the best term. It's a very uh, expansive skill set. Uh, but it's a, like a, your kit bag would be a small, limited kit bag. Uh, you can do whatever you want after you realize, oh, these are some of the good basic tools I should have, then you can expand. But there are people out there that will say, hey, I heard of this new thing. I love this entry stuff. I love the covert stuff. I love the lock picking and the bypassing. If your time, your training time, if your available training budget, if the space in your vehicle or your truck or your garage or your workshop, if you have the ability and the space and the time and the funding to go nuts with this stuff, you get to make that choice to go, hey, bypass drivers are really make model specific for certain padlocks and door locks. I'm going to buy all of them, and I'm going to buy locks to practice on for all of them, and I'm going to get a kit, a backpack that's like a three-day bag full of all the bypass drivers for all the padlocks, and I'm going to buy a bunch of those leashy tools, which are fantastic. I'm going to buy a bunch of leashy tools for like just a ton of make models of locks because it's a really good tool. Okay, cool. We support you. If that decision makes sense for your lifestyle. So it would be a very bad decision to tell someone if they said, hey, I want to get into lockpicking. It would be bad training advice for us to say, go buy every single model of leashy tool. They're expensive, they're delicate, um, and they're very make model specific. So just buy a bunch of them and throw them in a, a plastic grocery bag and just carry those around. That would be bad advice for us. Yeah, and again, I think that designating things in a first responder is more just being realistic with yourself about what situations you will probably be in. So, yeah, like you said, if you are gung-ho about this and want to be as prepared as possible, even if you're not, go for it. Like, this isn't like a first responders deserve, you know, or are better than people. It's just, hey, realistically, if you're going to... Realistically, they use it all the time. (laughs) Yeah. It's really well. yeah, it, so it, so exactly. If, if like you work in more of like an office setting, like there's nothing wrong with that. You'll definitely still run into lockout emergencies in your life. This is just more if you're looking for a starting place, if you have a limited budget, that designation is more about just being honest with assessing how often you need it and what you need it. So you mentioned Lishy. So did you want to hit that before we cover or before we end this? That when should you look at Lishy's? What Lishy should you look at? Is it something that you need to consider as someone who's new to the skill set? Uh, you know, I think they're one of the best tools to hit lock picking within the last decade, period. Uh, but they're very, very specific for what locks they'll work on. So it's not a huge return on investment um, as far as general preparedness. Uh, it is a pretty big return on investment um, if it's a common lock making model out there and you buy the Leashy for that common make model lock, uh, the Leashy tool, when we teach our courses, students often will go, how do I do raking and tension wrench with these Bogotas? Oh, cool. And they go, this is amazing. And then we, we do some advanced picking, usually the end of our first day, the, begin, the beginning of our second day of our tactical lock picking course. And sometimes students will go, oh, so advanced pin manipulation is single pin picking. And some of them, not all of them, some of them go, oh my God, this makes so much sense. And other ones go, oh, I'm really struggling. And other ones go, I I don't like it. I'll just rake. Those are all good answers. But I'll then show them, hey, this is a leashy tool. You put it into the right keyway and you fold out this little flap and you apply tension to it. And then you use this chart in your hook pick that's attached to do single pin picking, but with a specialized tool for it. And sometimes, well, actually most times, after students put their hands on a leashy tool, especially newer students, they go, oh my God, I'm buying one of these right now. Where do I find one? Um, And that's because, oh, now I understand single pin picking so much better. So it's tough to get the right tension wrench in the right spot with the right amount of tension and to maintain that tension while you're using a brand new tool. Like a, a, you have to get the right hook pick with the right profile and the right thickness to lift the right pins in the right places. And that, that's a skill set that takes some time to develop. So the Leashy tool can really develop your single pin picking faster. But what I think probably Dave would agree with me, uh, let me know if you don't, would be as long as you're using your Leashy tool intentionally to help you overcome a specific problem, that's great. If you're using your Leashy tool to say, 
Eh, I don't really want to learn how locks work, so I'll just use this leashy thing as a crutch. Then I think that's a bad decision. Um, so we are in the in the business of helping you design your overall entry skill set. We're not in the business of going, uh, this tool and this lock, if you use this technique, it will open. Good luck. Have fun. We'll give you that info, but we will also help you design an approach for making entry. And so we will help you ask the right questions and find your own answers for how do I design the tools that I choose? You know, how do I design my loadout bag? How do I make it fit in my area of operations? You know, which tool should I use on an obstacle and when? So those are the things that we specialize in. Cool. Yeah, just a couple points. Um, and then I'm probably good to wrap up. But Perfect. yeah, with the leashy tools, I think the lowest I've seen them is around $70 a pop. Uh-huh. You can regularly see them at $100 a pop. And like we said, the raking is not typically lock manufacturer specific. You might have some companies that only make high security locks, but more or less, your raking and your foundation skill sets will just apply to so much more that exactly like you said, if you just rely on a lishy pick, you're cheating yourself out of a super widely applicable skill set. Uh, that being said, if you really wanted to stretch into lishies, there are some that can work on multiple keyways for one manufacturer. So the Slage one that would get you into residential Slage keyways, which this is getting a little out of the scope of this episode when we get to identifying key brands and keyways for starting. But take but take away from this part is residential locks are often in the U.S. either Quickset or Slage. So there are two lishies you can buy that will cover most residential locks. Once you start getting into commercial and high security locks, that's when you start branching off into a bunch of different lishies. So we don't have to get too far into it, but that would just be my last thing to wrap up on lishies. Is there are two of them, but you're still looking at one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollar investment for only two brands of locks, and a lot of times, if these locks are being used in a residential setting, they might be just as susceptible to raking. Or picking too. So that's a lot of money to invest in addition if you are just starting out and just have a limited budget. Great tools, but just be aware of their place. And that's all I had really on Lishies, at least in this scope of things. Cool. I'll wrap up with a short overview, which is learn those big five first. And we usually recommend learning actual picking of lock keyways first. You can do it for 25 bucks or less and you can learn how to manipulate pins and get a tumbler to tumble over and you can get locks to unlock for you. Um, and it's a huge return on investment. You're spending 25 bucks for a toolkit. It's pretty quick to get your first entry. Um, I would be surprised if even self-guided just through watching YouTube videos, I'd be surprised if you couldn't open a padlock somewhere on your property or in your house on the first day of using that tool. Um, and then once you get that opening, you can apply it to hundreds of thousands of locks across the country with just one day of practice. Um, and then I'd learn the big five um, and then I'd start branching out where it makes sense for you and your budget and your mission. And uh, I hope that y'all got some value out of today's show. Let's do some housekeeping to close it up. A uh, little extra housekeeping today. Uh, first up, thanks a million to our current Patreon. It, it is, it's the backbone of what we do. Um, having that support to help us pay for our editing programs, pay for our software, uh, pay for our hosting platforms and our publishing is a big deal. This is very expensive behind the scenes and the whole world gets this info for free. So the Patreon are literally supporters. They support us. Uh, anyone above the $2 level on our Patreon gets access to our after show, which we're going into shortly. Um, and we don't hide super secret information there about high quality, high quality training. Uh, we hide our worst info there, which is just us being a bunch of fucking goofballs. Uh, next, we're starting to finalize our 2023 calendar for in-person course offerings. So if you're interested in doing some in-person training with us, stay tuned. Uh, the easiest way to find info on that is go to our homepage, which is utac.io. That's U-T-A-C dot I-O. And just click on courses, and that's where all of our updates will be for next year. We're going to start putting that together around uh, probably late September or October. We'll start getting 2023's calendar posted to the website. Uh, we love teaching people in person. We, we love going out and meeting weird people and getting hands on and, and having these tools get put into our students' hands and getting them some entries. So stick around for that. 
We also have a video course out. If you can't make it to our courses um, or if you want your budget to stay a little smaller, we do have a online video course. It's basically our two-day tactical lockpicking course just taught from me to the camera instead of me to a classroom of in-person students. Uh, we've gotten a lot of very good feedback for that. You can also find that on our homepage. Just go to utac.io and you can click on Tactical Lockpicking 101. It's a video course. It's still on discount because we've had a lot of people very, very happy with it. So we're trying to get it out to as many people as possible that want it. Uh, it's on discount for 250 bucks. I think the normal uh, rate that we had decided to go with was around four or 500 bucks. So please, if you're interested in that, get it before the price goes up. If you want a high quality protection dog, please just email me, pat at utac.io. We will see some of you on the next after show. Well, we'll see some of you in the after show. We'll see the rest of you on the next episode. Thanks so much for coming, everybody.